So I'm going to show you some of our res results on the IGF BP7 in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But first I wanted to share, just a moment, a little bit where do we work? And this is uh, in here in Brazil, Southeastern region. Here is a picture of our institution. So this is the hospital and these are houses for the patients that come from far from, from the city. A radiotherapy unit and here behind this building, we, we've got this uh, brand new research building which was inaugurated in 2018. And the hospital is dedicated to treat cancer, children with, with cancer, and the cure rates have, have improved a lot in the last uh, 10 years. We are in an, in, on average at 75% of survival rates for almost all the tumors, okay? So it's one of the reference uh, hospital for, for oncology in Brazil. Uh, I divided my presentation in three, in three sessions. First, a short introduction. Then I will talk about the paracrine uh, role of IGF-VP7 in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And finally, the autocrine effects of IGF-VP7 and the EGF system in, in leukemia. So the, the acute lymphoblastic leukemia originates from precursors, precursors of, of the lymphoid cell lineage and is the most frequent cancer in children. It accounts for about one fourth of all kinds of cancer in, in that uh, age. 85% uh, of Acute lymphoblastic leukemia originates from B cells and 15% for from T cells. They are treated uh, the same way, whether it is a B or T cell leukemia, they are treated the same way uh, in most protocols. Uh, treatment is done using uh, basically by chemotherapy. And I, I'm showing here some of the of the drug that 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 has been used for the last for, for the last 30, 40 years, and that are used even today. Um, and the treatment lasts for about two, two and a half years, uh, basically with three phases, one uh, induction phase that lasts one month, then a consolidation intensification phase that lasts for three to to six months, depending on the patient's risk. And then a maintenance phase, which lasts for one and a half year to two years approximately. And this last phase is, is uh, treatment is done basically using methotrexate and mercaptopurine. And the patient does this at home. Uh, the, the survival rate is are about seventy five to eighty five percent, depending on the on on the of course on the on the country. In the in the best developed countries, it reaches more than ninety percent nowadays. The problem with 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 treatment is are relapses. Okay, twenty percent of patients that are not cured is because leukemia relapses. And this happens, happens because of uh, intrinsic drug, drug resistance. What I mean with the intrinsic, yeah, I mean that uh, the leukemic cells, uh, since the beginning, they already are more resistant. Those, those patients who are going to relapse, since the big, before treatment, they already are more resistant to treatment. Of course, there, some, some, there are some mutations also that may uh, select a clone that, uh, that resists and, and then later relapses. But look at this. When you analyze the drug resistance to different drugs of samples at treatment initiation compared to relapse, you see that at relapse, 
the lethal dose is, much, is higher also in the top range in comparison to diagnostic samples. Here to thioguanine, aracetine, asparaginase, and downorubicin. So you see that in relapses, the cells are resistant to treatment. Not that they got this resistance during treatment. Usually they are already resistant at, at initiation, even when it is just a subclone. But the interaction of leukemic cells with other cells in the bone marrow, namely with the stroma cells, provides a protection to leukemic cells. And this is an experiment, uh, these are results published in, in 2000 using cell lines that when we're cultured with these stroma cells, they are more resistant to two different uh, drugs, ARA, ARA C and VP16. You see, when cultured with uh, the stroma cell, they are more resistant than when culture alone. This for JIRCAD not, but for these other two cells, yes. And when you block one adhesion molecule, you can uh, inhibit this, this uh, resistance induced by the, the interaction with the stroma cells. So at that, um, how do we get to IGF BP7 and IGF1 leukemia? This was uh, about in 2004 when I came back from the from the from my postdoc, and a group from Netherlands they published a nice paper where they uh, evaluated. Uh, they did in parallel two things. First, they performed gene expression analysis, and that was the time when gene expression using microarrays was just starting. Uh, they perform gene expression analysis of diagnostic samples, and also they 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 perform chemotherapy sensitivity or resistant assays in vitro for the same cells. Okay, and they got to a series of genes that were upregulated or or downregulated in resistant cells here depicted as red uh, little circles. And for instance, this is a, a, one of the genes that appears in leukemia resistant to asparaginase was igf bp 7 along with other, other genes like GATA3 or SCGF, etc. So then there was a series of genes for resistant, uh, associated with resistance to the different, to four different drugs used in, in leukemia therapy. IGF BP7, as you probably know, it stands for uh, insulin like growth factor binding protein seven. So there are different, uh, several IGF BP proteins. Six of them are, let's say, the canonical ones. They bind, they bind with a strong affinity to, to IGF so that uh, the circulating IGF is always bound by one of IGF BP proteins. There are IGF BP1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, okay? But IGF BP7 belongs to a different kind of uh, these binding proteins, they bind with lower affinity to IGF, about a hundred times lower affinity than the canonical ones. And, but they do, IGF EP7 was shown to interact with insulin with high affinity, not as high as the insulin receptor, but with high affinity. It was also described as a, an adhesion molecule, and it binds also to other chemokines. There are several works that have been done with the IGF BP7. Okay, so in uh, at that point we knew that IGF BP7 somehow modulated the action of uh, IGF or insulin in the organism. 
and I will start then my first, uh, the first part of my seminar uh, reporting on the paracrine effect of igf -BP cell. We were interested in looking if these, uh, the resistant genes published by the, the, the group from, from Netherlands were also responsible responsive to the leukemia strong interaction. So the hypothesis was that interaction of when I will put when I culture leukemic cells with the bone marrow stroma, they will upregulate the drug resistance genes. Okay. And so those genes, those genes will be valuable therapeutic targets. If we if we if we could target those genes, we will be inhibiting the interaction of uh, leukemia with this trauma, particularly on the, on the function related to drug resistance, because we wanted to, to tackle uh, the leukemia resistance to therapy since the beginning. So we performed a simple experiment here. We culture stroma cells, which are the big ones, with the leukemic cells, which are these small, little yellow uh, circles here, for zero or six hours. And then we did a, a quantitative PCR to check the, for the expression of different genes uh, uh, discovered by the, by the Netherlands group for, the, for different, group, for different uh, drugs. Sorry. So for asparaginase, these three here were the genes that were upregulated in, in primary leukemic cells at diagnosis. And we found that one of them did not respond to this trauma interaction, but IGFVP7 one was one of the, the, the genes that whose expressions in, increased significantly when leukemic cells were put in contact with the stroma cells. So you see that the four change activation comparing six hour to zero hour reaches in median about uh, four here, four times, okay? So we went on on studying igf -BP 7 And one of our first experiments was to check if the addition of IGF recombinant igf -BP 7 to culture assays, we culture uh, uh, patients, different 12 patients, leukemic cells with a stroma layer. We culture uh, with igf -BP 7 with the asparaginase drug in black, and in combination, igf -BP 7 plus asparaginase. And what we observed was that the addition of igf -BP 7 caused a significant uh, resistance to asparaginase. So you see here is the, the cell culture without the chemotherapy. Then with chemotherapy asparaginase, you have a, a, a decrease in, in survival. But when you add igf -BP 7 you have a, a restore, restoration of, the, of cell viability even in presence of uh, uh, asparaginase. Then we have to, to uh, I'm not showing the results, but both leukemic cells and bone marrow stroma cells, both express igf -BP 7 So we wonder whether the igf -BP 7 molecules produced by leukemic cells would it make any difference? Because you know, stroma cells are much bigger, and we suppose the, the bigger the bigger cell is, go, is the one that produces all the igf -BP 7 So the one that is produced by leukemic cell is of uh, no matters because stroma is going to provide for all that is needed. Or even in, in if you think on the whole organism. There are some organs that produce more igf -BP 7 than, than the, the bone marrow stroma. Uh, so we perform uh, 
é, gene silencing assays using cell lines, stroma cell lines or leukemic cell lines. Here we show two different cell lines. And we silence IGFBP7, either on the stroma cell here in, in red or in the leukemia cells here in red, the little circle in red, okay? And we show here an ELISA for IGFBP7 when both cells are white type. This is the amount uh, in condition culture media. When we silence IGFBP7 in, in the stroma cells, we have a little drop here. But when we silence the uh, IGFBP7 in the leukemic cells, we have a much higher drop. The amount of cells, of course, in the culture is different. We have about uh, 10 times more leukemic cells than, uh, than stroma cells. But you know, the size of leukemic cells is about 10 times or even uh, lower, uh, lower than the, the size of the stroma cells. But this is to show, just to show that the, the IGFBP7 produced by leukemic cells makes a difference in the co-culture system that we are using. The same here for, the, uh, for another cell line, you see when the, both cells are white type and when we silence the, the leukemic cell, IGFP7, we have a big drop in, in, the, in the amount of, of uh, soluble IGFBP7. Um, when we analyze the amount of IGFBP7 in the bone marrow stroma, we see, we compare the, the, the sorry, no bone marrow stroma, the bone marrow plasma. We see that uh, the plasma obtained from diagnostic bone marrow samples from children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia has much higher amounts of IGFBP7 than plasma from control donors. These are, this is also bone marrow from control, uh, from children, most are children that have uh, donated bone marrow for, for bone marrow transplantation. So the amount of IGFP7 is much higher in the bone marrow from, from leukemic patients. And the amount of IGFP7 here uh, measured by ELISA is proportional to the uh, number of blasts, the concentration of blasts in bone marrow multiplied by the expression of IGFP7. So there was a, an, 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 a nice correlation of only 41%, but significant correlation. Uh, meaning that uh, leukemic blasts contribute to most of uh, IGFBP7 that we see in the, in the bone marrow of patients. And what is the effect of this uh, IGFBP7 on, on leukemia resistance to, to asparaginase? So we performed a similar experiment to the previous one, but in this case, we have uh, we analyzed the, the cell survival, okay? Here are the, the annexing negative cells, meaning that cells that are not in, in apoptosis. When we culture uh, both uh, wild type leukemia and uh, mesenchyme stem cells from bone marrow, both wild, wild type, with low low amount of asparaginase. Okay, this is these are not the uh, fifty percent lethal dose. It, this is only uh, uh, ten percent lethal dose. We have a survival of about eighty percent. When one of the cells, the stroma cells, were uh, knocked down, we have a little decrease in survival. When leukemic cells were knocked down, we have a strong decrease in survival of, le of leukemic cells. And when both were knocked down, this was even, uh, survival was even lower. But when recombinant 
IGF VP7 were add to the to the culture media, we we restore the survival of cells, meaning that indeed uh, this uh, this factor is uh, in fact important for uh, leukemia resistance to this drug to asparaginase. I didn't mention, by it, but the name says that says this that asparaginase is a is a biological drug, an enzyme that degrades asparagine, and uh, leukemia blasts are particularly uh, uh, vulnerable to the lack of asparagine in the culture media. Even though asparagine is not one of the essential amino acids. And it's a drug that was discovered uh, more than 30, 30 years, more than 40 or even 50 years ago. Uh, how is it that, that IGF BP7 is triggering this uh, resistance to asparaginase? So at the point when we were uh, having these results, there was a nice paper published uh, by the group of uh, Dario Campana from St. Jude, showing that mesenchymal, bone marrow mesenchymal cells uh, had a protective effect on, on leukemic cells by expressing uh, asparagine synthetase and producing asparagine the amino acid producing and secreting this amino acid to the culture media, thus providing uh, the, um, the amino acid needed for leukemic cell. So if you imagine that you are using a drug that is uh, degrading asparagine, but the stroma is providing asparagine to uh, constantly providing asparagine, you got a, a, a counteracting mechanism that go, goes against the the, the, the drug, the, the, the chemotherapeutic drug. So we, we, having this result in mind, we investigated whether igf 7 will induce asparagine synthetase in bone marrow stroma cells. And this is, this is an experiment of, of uh, quantitative uh, reverse transcriptase PCR, showing that addition of uh, igf 7 plus insulin induced the expression of the asparagine, asparagine synthetase gene. Okay, this is a higher level at six hours after stimulation, and then it got down after 24 hours. And this is the control. We investigate whether that, that will happen with different cells from bone marrow. We tested uh, bone marrow stroma cells, bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, and bone marrow endothelial cells. Okay, with control, treated with insulin, treated with igf 7 alone, but in culture media with serum. So there are the serum uh, has some, some little amount of, of, of insulin and IGF. And insulin plus igf 7 So you see that when you use both factors together is when you have the, the higher uh, expression levels of asparagine synthetase by the, by the stroma cells. And this happens, uh, uh, but it seems that uh, the stroma cells, which are uh, mostly fibroblast cells, are the ones that produce higher, apparently, higher amount of this uh, asparagine synthetase gene, much higher than what we see with the mesenchymal cells or endothelial cells. Endothelial cells seems not to respond that much to, uh, to igf 7 in terms of, of uh, asparagine synthetase. Asparagine synthetase, of course, is, is an enzyme that is within the stroma cell, but is going to, uh, to, to, to synthesize more asparagine, the amino acid, 
and those cells release the amino acid to the culture media. So we performed kind of a HPLC assays. We measure uh, the production of uh, the amount of different, all different amino acids in the culture media of uh, bone marrow stroma cells. We culture those cells in medium uh, free of asparagine, asparagine. And when culture for after 24 hours or 40 hours of culture, we measure the amount of the different amino acids. And we see that in the control cell, there is a little production of asparagine. You see, we can see a little increase, not that much when cells, uh, when insulin was, was added to, the, to this culture media. This is serum free culture media. Okay. But when insulin plus IGF 57 was added to this serum free media, you see that as after 48 hours, the amount of asparagine in the condition, condition. And this happened uh, both with uh, uh, insulin plus IGF BP7 or with IGF1 or IGF2. Okay. This is not only with insulin, but also happened with IGF1 and IGF2. But always when you use IGF BP7 together, okay, when you use the, the growth factor alone the amount of production of uh, asparagine amino acid is not that much, that, that higher, okay? You get really a, a full change when you use IGF-BP7. So uh, these, are, these results were all published in, in 2012. Um, and, and, and in summary, what we got here is that when stroma cells and leukemia cells interact, leukemia cells will produce, uh, will, will transcribe the IGF BP7 uh, gene. The IGF BP7 will bind IGF or insulin and stimulate the stroma cells, which will produce more asparagine. And this is the asparagine which is going to. Uh, promote resistance to asparaginase, okay? And if that is true, we will expect that uh, uh, leukemic cells that express higher igf 7 will be more uh, resistance to treatment than those that produce lower igf 7 And this is what uh, we show here. Because asparaginase is, is really one of the, uh, of the uh, most important drugs used in, in, in ALL treatment, okay? And we see that the, we divided in quartiles the, uh, a number of 147 patients and the leukemia-free survival, okay? We are only considering uh, from, from remission to relapse, uh, and we see that patients with higher IGF BP7 uh, had uh, higher relapse rates than those that have low IGF BP7. Okay, this is a tendency. The level of the IGF BP7, the higher the IGF BP7, the higher the chances of, of, of leukemia relapse. So in conclusion for this part, to sum up all the, the results that I have shown you, and then we go to the second part, bone marrow stroma cell stimulates expression of igf 7 in the leukemia cells. Addition of igf 7 plus insulin or other IGF growth factor to the culture assay protects ILL cells from 
asparaginase cytotoxicity. Uh, uh, the leukemia blasts are an important source of IGF BP7 in the bone marrow microenvironment. IGF BP7 enhances the asparagine synthetase gene expression in bone marrow stroma cell. And this is dependent on insulin and, or, or EGF. And higher IGF BP7 expression levels were significantly associated with lower leukemia free survival in precursor B cell, acute lymphoblastic leukemia that were uh, Philadelphia chromosome positive ne negative. Okay. This was, this was only on B cell, this uh, leukemia free survival effect. Uh, uh, was was seen on on B cells, okay, not on the T cells. Uh, so I'm coming to the second part of my seminar, where I will talk about the autocrine effects of IGF BP7. I've shown you the paracrine effects, the effects that uh, the IGF BP7 have on stromas, on stroma cells. And now we'll, I will show you the effect that IGF-BP7 has on the leukemia cell. They produce and it, it comes back to stimulate their own cells. First, uh, leukemia cells, both B cell precursor, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or T cell ALL, express the receptors, insulin receptor or the IGF-1 receptor, okay, which are the, the canonical, the receptor that, that will transduce a signal upon insulin or IGF stimulation. Uh, but the, the receptor expressed, the insulin receptor expressed by leukemia cells is the one that is devoid of exon 11, which is typical of fetal tissues or cancer tissues. is a, is a, a splice isoform of the insulin receptor, which is different than the one that is expressed by in fat tissue, muscles, and, or liver, okay? Anyway, both B cell or T cell, ALL express the insulin receptor and the IGF-1 receptor. Meaning that IGF BP7, uh, when binding to insulin or IGF1, could have also an effect on leukemia cells, not only on the bone marrow stroma cells, but also on the leukemia cell side. So we, when we silence it, the, the IGF BP7 here using two different uh, shRNAs, on different ALL cell lines. And here is just to show that silence, uh, silence work. Um, this is Western blood. We saw that cells with silenced uh, IGF BP7 uh, have a, a proliferate, uh, have a lower proliferation rate in comparison to white type. Here for, for, for all the four cell lines and for the two different uh, SHRNAs. Um, we repeated those essays uh, using patient samples, okay? Because when you, you know, cell lines are not always a good representative of primary cell because Cell lines are cells that have, uh, have accumulated a lot of different mutations, are, are cells that are usually primary ALL cells, do not, uh, do not survive in vitro. They tend to die in three, four days, they are all dead. Um, so our more uh, is a different uh, cell, okay? We evaluated here the, the via cell viability after 48 or 24 hours for, for some time for T cells. 
of sales culture in co control media. These are this is a serum free media, but has a, a serum albumin and, um, and a little of insulin also. Is a serum is is medium AM5 from Thermo Thermo Fisher Scientific, uh, formerly uh, Invitrogen. Uh, we found that using culturing cell, this primary cell with insulin plus IGFBP7, we have an increase in cell viability in all cases, both for B ALL and also for T ALL. You have a big increase in the in cell viability when those cells were cultured in presence of insulin and IGFBP7. Here is not uh, uh, co-culture. I mean, there is no Bomeris trauma layer here, okay? These are just culturing of uh, leukemia cells alone. Uh, so we, 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 we wonder whether that was an effect caused by insulin or could be also the same effect by using IGF-1 or IGF-2. And we, we show here that both uh, insulin or IGF-1 or IGF-2, when in conjunction with igf 7 promotes uh, the survival of, of primary ALL cells, okay? Here, not for this patient, but here, here, almost all patients. And most importantly, we, uh, when we, we transplanted the, the silent cells into not skid mice, we saw that uh, silencing of IGFBP7 was uh, uh, highly detrimental to leukemia progression in vivo, okay? So imagine that you have a, a, an animal that has, a wild type bone marrow, wild type organs, everything is okay. So it produces IGFBP7, okay, in circulation. There is IGFBP7 in circulation, but the leukemia that you are injecting is not producing locally IGFBP7, okay? That was uh, uh, detrimental to leukemia meaning that it is the amount of IGF-BP7, which is really close to the leukemia niche that is going to make the difference. The circulating IGF-BP7, because the mouse IGF-BP7 is circulating, and we have used uh, uh, mouse or human IGF-BP7 with similar results. The circulating IGF-BP7 is not uh, uh, is not going to uh, to change uh, the fact that the, the, the leukemic niche is devoid of IGFBP7. And progression, as measured by org organ infiltration of leukemic blast, was uh, significantly affected uh, when the IGFBP7 was silenced. In, the, in all five different cell lines, here are three B cell. And these two are T cell uh, leukemia cell lines. You see uh, in liver, in spleen, in the bone marrow, you see a, a big difference in the amount of cells infiltrating those organs. And this translates also into uh, uh, an increased survival of animals that were that received the cells that had uh, silenced IGF BP cell. But we wanted, or you know, that was done with uh, leukemia cell lines, and we wanted to uh, to to see if that if that will be the case in in primary cells. And for uh, as you know, uh, trans uh, transduction and, and silencing and selecting of uh, of a primary cell with a knockdown gene is not that simple because, as I mentioned to you. Those cells tend, uh, ILL, ALL cells tend to die when culturing in vitro. So it is difficult to transduce and select the clone with a knockdown gene. 
So we had to find another way and we produce uh, a monoclonal antibody against igf bp 7 I show here that this antibody recognizes both the human and the, and the mouse igf bp 7 This is a commercial, commercially available uh, antibody which recognizes only the human uh, igf bp 7 our clone recognize, recognizes both the human and the mouse, though with higher affinity, the human IGF-7. And we first evaluated whether this antibody will, be, will have any effect in vitro, and we use these cell lines. And we show here in comparison to an antibody against the prostate, prostate antigen as a control. We see the anti IGF BP7 had a, 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 a strong effect on, on ALL viability. The same, the same was seen with the commercial antibody, but these are cell lines. We repeated those assays using uh, primary cells. And so I, I'm, I'm showing here three different patients. Uh, treated with control, 71% of cells are alive. When a, the anti-prostate antigen antibody was used, 70% alive. When the anti-IGF BP7 was used, only 57% was alive. In this other sample, you see 71%. And when the antibody was used, 36%, it means half the amount of the control. And here again, 76%, 34%, half the amount, okay? These are B cells, in T cells, uh, the same. 78% alive in the control, only 12% when, when the antibody was used, okay? Here the same, half the amount and half the amount. Uh, so meaning that the the the, Remember that the addition of igf 7 to culture media will increase the uh, proliferation or the mitogenic activity of those cells. When we neutralize igf 7 using an antibody, we got, of course, the opposite effect, a decreased survival of cells. And then we, we use that antibody, we injected mice, three times per week with uh, 20 micrograms of antibody intraperitoneally uh, for a period of four weeks. Okay, we starting when animals, uh, when animals, uh, we injected animals, when leukemia, uh, human leukemia cells appear in peripheral blood at the amount of 0.5% in half the animals, we started treatment, okay? So when leukemia was already established and we started treatment that lasted for during four, four weeks and then we stopped. You see that uh, animals treated with v -Col or the anti-prostate antigen antibody uh, diet after 24, 28 days, while animals treated with the anti igf 7 uh, died only with about 40 days. The same for a T cell leukemia. You see a big difference. Here we use as a control a polyclonal, uh, just polyclonal Ig, IgG from, from, from mice. And may, uh, the animals treated with the anti igf 7 you have a, a big increase in survival. And also we recorded whether this, uh, uh, the effect of the antibody on the amount of uh, leuke leukemia cells in peripheral blood. In the control animal, you see that the amount of peri uh, leukemia cells in the peripheral blood increases a long time. And in animals treated with the anti igf 7 you, you, you have a, a, a control of, the, of, of leukemia proliferation. You see that they do not increase, okay? 
So in this, uh, in, in this experiment here, if we, if we continue treating, we don't know if we, if we had continued treating animals for longer times, maybe uh, animals will, will survive longer, okay? We stopped at, at 28 days, but if we continue it, maybe we could have control uh, these cells uh, for longer. So we are very uh, enthusiastic about this uh, this antibody as a therapeutic uh, as a thera uh, as a possible therapeutic antibody. Uh, how is it that the the now let's go to the mechanism? How is it that the the extracellular IGF BP seven promotes the the mitogenic and survival effects on, on, on acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So as you probably know, the IGF-1 receptor or even the insulin receptor, they, they trigger two different uh, signaling. One, which is the PI3K AKT pathway and the other is the RAS ERK pathway, okay? And we investigated whether uh, igf 7 will interfere with, uh, with that signaling. And, and as you know, as, as you see here, this every, uh, each single point is a single different primary acute lymphoblastic leukemia sample uh, where we evaluated Phospho AKT using ELISA assays because you know we don't have uh, that that uh, uh, the amount of, of primary cells that we have is not that much is not enough to do Western blood uh, and then we use an ELISA uh, anti phospho AKT assay and each single point is a different patient okay. Mm -hmm. And we evaluated phosphorylation of AKT after 15 minutes and after four hours. We always do that. We, we when we test, uh, you know, when you test uh, uh, cell signaling, you have to perform a short time point and a longer time point. So, in 15 minutes, uh, treatment of cells with insulin alone, you already have phosphorylation of AKT which proves that the expression of the insulin or the IGF-1 receptor by ALL cells is, is uh, functional. That receptor is functional on those cells. Uh, stimulation with igf 7 alone causes no difference. And the, the combi com combination, combinat, uh, Combined use of insulin with igf 7 causes the same effect seen with insulin alone, okay? This is in 15 minutes, but in four hours, that is quite different. Only cells that were stimulated with insulin plus igf 7 uh, remains uh, with phospho AKT, uh, with AKT phosphorylated. Meaning that IGF BP7 somehow prolongs uh, signaling of the, we don't know uh, at, at, at this point, we didn't know yet. Uh, it promoted signaling by the IGF 1R or the insulin receptor. Uh, so in this experiment, we evaluated whether signaling was uh, uh, by both receptors or only one of them. And we, as you see here in 15 minutes, both the insulin receptor is phosphorylated when treated with insulin or insulin plus IGF-1 cell. And the IGF-1 receptor is also phosphorylated, okay? But at four hours, the insulin receptor is not phosphorylated, while the IGF-1 receptor maintained uh, its phosphorylation. Meaning that uh, 
uh, IGF BP7 is prolonging is prolonging uh, the activity of the IGF-1 receptor, but not that of the insulin receptor. And this also means that it is not simply the case that IGF-BP7 is uh, increasing the half-life of insulin, which was an effect already published long time ago. Because if, if that were true, then we would expect to see also the insulin receptor active after four hours because uh, insulin is the same here and here in the, in, in the IGF-1 receptor, okay? So apparently in the igf bp 7 is prolonging the activity of the IGF-1 receptor only. And when we uh, performed a time course assay using also ELISA on cells treated with IGF-1, plus igf bp 7 here is the, the amount of, of factors that we use. We see it in black that the insulin receptor has an increased phosphorylation of AKT, which reaches maximum at 15 minutes. Then it, go, it, it drops down to almost background levels after, let's say, three hours here, but at maybe two hours while the, the IGF-1 receptor and AKT remains uh, phosphorylated, okay? This for two different uh, cell lines, okay? This again to show that the, the first that IGF-1 is able to stimulate leukemia cells, and second that the addition of igf bp 7 prolongs the activation. Of the, of the IGF-1 receptor, not the insulin receptor. Um, to prove, to, to confirm those results, we silence the, I, uh, uh, we knock out the IGF-1 receptor into different cell lines. Here showing the, the knock, knock, knockout using CRISPR. And when those, we repeated those essays uh, using the, the, I'm not, I cannot see here because of the, let me, ah, okay. Using IGF-1 or igf bp 7 We see phosphorylation of AKT when both, after four hours, when both molecules were, were used, but not in the cells with the knockout receptor, okay? not in the cell with the knockout research. Just to confirm that this effect was uh, uh, directly caused, uh, IKT phosphorylation was directly a consequence of IGF-1 receptor phosphorylation because it could be by another receptor, you know? Uh, you know that in, in a simplistic view, uh, um, because of, of what we know from a whole organism, we usually used to think that insulin, uh, activation of the insulin receptor causes a metabolic action, while activation of the IGF-1 receptor causes growth, differentiation, proliferation, or survival, a mitogenic effect. And this is because this is what is seen in animals that have a, a, a yeah, a mutation in the insulin receptor or, or, or a mutation in the IG, IGF-1 receptor. The whole animal, you see metabolic problems when you have a, a mutation on the insulin pathway and you have a, a grow retardation when you have a mutation in the IGF-1 receptor. This is true for the whole organism, but it's not true for cells. Uh, several experiments that are already published in the, in the literature show that both receptors, insulin receptor or the IGF-1 receptor, they uh, trigger uh, both metabolic and, and mitogenic actions. Okay, the same metabolic and mitogenic action. That was proved by different uh, gene expression assays performed with, uh, with different cells. 
So we treated ALL cell with uh, in, in sinum free media for six hours with IGF-1 and IGF-BP7. And look at the differential expressed genes to see whether uh, what kind of uh, genetic program was activated by treatment with IGF-1 and IGF-BP7. And we see here that the programs are uh, oxidative phosphorylation, meaning that the mitochondria was activated, emitol one signaling, which is also metabolic, MIC targets, which are metabolic and mitogenic, cholesterol homeostasis and fold protein response. Here, depogenesis, which is metabolic, E2F, which is uh, the mitogenic, okay? pa 3 k mitol glycolysis, mitotic spindle. So it activates both uh, metabolic and mitogenic uh, uh, programs, genetic programs. And here just showing the gene set enrichment analysis, showing uh, enrichment of genes uh, uh, related to oxidative phosphorylation, glycolysis, and here the pa 3 k T. We have also uh, performed some uh, mitochondrial uh, uh, metabolic assays, which I, I'm not familiar with, so I didn't. Uh, I prefer not to show because I couldn't. I wouldn't be able to discuss. But the, our collaborator, uh, which is an expert in the area, uh, confirmed that the, the activation of the IGF plus IGF BP7. The use of these uh, factors on ALL cell activated the mitochondria and glycolysis. And we see just showing you a confocal experiment showing how activation, uh, the stimulation with IGF 1, IGF BP7 induced the expression of the uh, glucose receptor in the cell surface of primary ALL cells. And this, of course, when you have a higher amount of GLUT1 in the cell uh, surface, you have increased amount of glucose, in, uh, glucose inside the cell. And, and this is going to cause a, an, an increased metabolism of, of that cells, which are responsible for, you see, you have an increase in, in, in glucose and you have also stimulation of the program for metabolism and cell proliferation and survival. So this is a, a, a kind of a summary of this. Of uh, I didn't show you the, the experiment that we have uh, showing the retention of the receptor, the IGF-1 receptor in the cell surface, okay? Because that would be too much for today. But just a, a summary, we have, this is the normal situation. We have the IGF-1 receptor. When it is stimulated, the receptor is, goes through uh, uh, internalization and recycling. And this is why the signaling lasts for shorter periods, not more than, let's say two hours, one hour, two hours. But when you have the igf bp 7 uh, receptor is internalization is is uh, blocked, and then signaling through the PI3K AKT uh, is prolonged, is maintained, which results in uh, in the suppression of the GLUT1 uh, endocytosis and recycling also, and increased glucose uh, uptake by cells, which fuel the metabolism, the metabolism of, of acute lymphoblastic leukemia cells. So conclusions for the, for the second part, IGF BP7 enhances proliferation of, and the ability of ALL cells in an insulin IGF dependent manner. Uh, a monoclonal antibody uh, can be used to target IGF BP7, having a drastic effect on ALL viability and leukemia progression in vivo. Uh, physiolog uh, physiologic levels, I will come later to this, this word, physiologic levels of extracellular IGF BP7 prolongs the, the surface expression and activation of IGF-1 receptor AKT. Uh, 
uh, when, when it's stimulated by insulin or IGF in ALL, but has no uh, apparent effect on the insulin receptor. And the prolonged activation of IGF-1 receptor results in the upregulation of the energy metabolism and in increased glycolysis in ALL by GLUT1, by GLUT1 upregulation in cell surface. Okay. Um, why I'm saying physiologic level? There are several publications, not several, three or four publications in the literature in good in good journals, okay, in cell science signaling, uh, showing that IGF BP7 have a, a senescence effect, okay. Those papers and uh, those papers show that IGF BP7 have a senescence effect that it blocks the activity of IGF-1 receptor. But uh, those papers were, were done using uh, 10 micrograms per ml of IGF BP7, 20 micrograms of IGF BP7, okay? Which is way above the physiological level of IGF BP7 in, in the humans, in human serum, which is only, I think, 40 nanograms per ml, okay? In our, in our experiment, we are using 100 nanograms per ml. So, and we have repeat some of our experiment using 10 micrograms or 20 micrograms of per ml of IGF-BP7. And we also got the, the senescence effect, the, the pro-apopitotic effect of IGF-BP7. So at that very high level, which, is, which are not realistic, IGF-BP7 indeed uh, have, an, have a senescence effect, but those are not the physiological levels. So when, when one's work with, with, with this, uh, with IGF-BP7, it is important to use the physiological levels to see the, the real effects. So I'd like to thank people who work on this essay, uh, uh, especially two former, uh, a former student of, of mine, Angelo Laranjera, which, with, which started this, this experiment, and then later Leonardo Artico, which is about to defend her, his thesis uh, now in, in August. Uh, like to thank also Silvia Brandalizi, which is the our director and the the doctor responsible for patient samples. Uh, Juliana Ronchi, we performed the animal studies, and Livia also helped us with some of these studies. People from from the State University of Campina, Campinas, uh, Alexandri, Marcia, and Carolina. Last labs, Professor Lars Labs Rodek, with work. Uh, performed the amino acid quantification and also people from the Faculty of Medicine at the State University of Campina, uh, Professor Roger, which is the one that performed essays with the with mitochondrial and metabolism analysis together with Juliana. And Jose Barreto Carvalera helped us with the, and Sandra helped us with the cell signaling experiments. And the work was financed by, uh, by a grant from CNPQ, which is the National Council for Research, and FAPESP. Uh, 